Let's bring in the round table now from our ABC team, Matthew Dowd, Koki Roberts, and Pierre Thomas, along with former Obama advisor Van Jones, now with Crossfire and CNN, and former Bush White House press secretary Dana Perino from The Five on Fox News. And I want to talk about Detroit in a minute, but first, let's begin with the president's speech uh, on Friday. Remarkable, and, and Matthew Dowd, quite different from the president's past speeches on race, the few that he's, he's given, where he presented himself more as a bridge between white and black. Here he explicitly, you know, to coin a phrase, stood his ground, spoke as a black man to the rest of America. I, I think it was an, a very telling speech, actually. I, I've watched people in public life a lot and, and any, uh, people in private life, and sometimes they give they have a conversation in order to inform somebody, and sometimes they're having a conversation out loud with themselves. Mm -hmm. I thought a big part of his speech was something that he's been dealing with over the course of his years in public life, trying to grasp with where he is in all of this process. Obviously, he wanted to communicate. One of the things that I thought was a beautiful line in the speech said, if you want to honor Trayvon Martin, then violence isn't a way to honor him. So I thought he wanted to quell some of that and put that. But I think it was really a personal speech about his evolution, about where he is as a person, what he struggled with. And finally, I think freeing himself from some of the things he thought he had to do to order to be successful and say, like, here's my evolution. He in doesn't this have process. to run away from race yeah. anymore. But Van Jones, some of the president's critics in the African American community, including Tavis Smile, Cornell West and others, you know, say it's too little too late. The president hasn't spoken out yeah. enough on these issues, hasn't done enough. Well, uh, th there hasn't been that conversation. First, I just I think, let's applaud the president. He's supposed to be the educator in chief on a lot of these issues. And it would have been worse for the country if he had said, well, because I'm black, I can't talk about this. The fact that he was able to come forward and talk about it, I think is a good thing. And you know, public leaders do this all the time. They talk about their background, you know, if they're Irish, if they're Catholic. And also, you know, Jimmy Carter, uh, 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 Bill Clinton, uh, LBJ talked about race from a personal point of view, being white Southerners. And so he talked about it, and the republic still stood. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing, because people, I think, were afraid if he talked about it as a black man, we'd all you know, fall apart. We didn't. That's a good thing. There's other good things, too. You mentioned violence. There's been none. And not only that, these young people who've been speaking out have been very sophisticated politically. You've got color of change. They've got a million people online now. They're going to be working to fix stand your ground laws across the country in multiple legislatures. That's amazing. The Dream Defenders, a nonviolent sit-in protest with the, with the governor's office, no violence. They have their own bill they're putting forward called Trayvon's Law. Positive things are coming out of this, and I think we should celebrate the fact that the young people had gone out and rioted, we'd be talking about them. They're not rioting, they're being sophisticated, we should, we should applaud no them. No rioting, and Dana Prino, relatively muted response from most conservatives to the President's Friday speech. Right, well, part of that was that it comes on at 2 o'clock on a Friday, and, then there, and there is reason for that, as you remember. I think that there was a much more practical reason for the speech as well. Uh, I, I agree with on the personal pieces of it, but earlier in the week, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder had suggested at the NAACP meeting that there might be a federal prosecution brought against uh, George Zimmerman on a, on a civil rights charge. Uh, with the burden of proof being even higher for the federal government to bring something like that when the state government couldn't uh, meet its burden of proof, it is unlikely that that case, if it had gone forward, would have, would have been able to be successful. So I think what President Obama did practically was on Friday afternoon say, I know you're going to get together tomorrow. I'm glad that you are. I think that we've got a lot of work to do. But he signaled very strongly that there is not going to be a federal and case. Pierre, both, both the president and, and Eric Holder got very personal in their speeches, sort of in feel your pain speeches, but are those speeches really a substitute, as Dana points out, for pursuing this, uh, these charges? They're walking the tightrope. Uh, the Attorney General talked about how he had to have a conversation with his son after seeing what happened with Trayvon Martin, and 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier, his father had the same conversation with him. Um, in terms of the Justice Department, they are looking at the case, the FBI is aggressively pursuing the case, as Dana mentioned. Look. Uh, it's a long shot to bring a federal prosecution. But uh, I've been told by sources that they are going to examine all of the state's evidence, including stuff that they did not bring into trial. They will look at it. For example, the gun is not going anywhere. You know, Mr. Zimmerman right, is earlier not... Earlier we thought he was going to get it. Right? He's not getting the gun because it's evidence and they want everything on hold. And I will say this. Even though it's a long shot, it's a heck of a thing to have the FBI really pouring into your background and looking at you in the way that they are going to do over the coming weeks. But again, long shot. Okay, and Koki, the president probably had to give it for other reasons politically as well. He couldn't be silent. He couldn't be silent. Yeah. I mean, th that is absolutely right. Look, whatever the evidence was, whatever the legality was of this case, 
The bottom line is a, a boy was walking home from the store and ended up dead. And that is what is, is, has such outrage uh, in the African American community and, and understandable. Why wouldn't you be outraged? This child was killed. And, uh, and the president really did have to address it. I think his own children probably weighed in. Uh, when I was interviewing the first lady in Africa uh, 10 days or so ago, she said, you know, I don't land on him, but the kids do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that is, that's typical for a politician's family. Uh, and so I think that, that they probably said, Dad, you have to talk about this. It's all anybody at school's so, talking about. I think you're exactly right. Now, where does this all go from here? The president was sort of refreshing in saying he didn't want to call for this formal uh, conversation because he knows what can happen when, when presidents have done that in the past. He says it gets stilted and awkward, but we are going to have these debates about stand your ground, whether or not it's actually reduced violence or increased it. It's, it's, you know, well, it, 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 it it's, definitely... It's shoot out at the OK Corral. Well, well, here's the... I think the president <laughs> understands what the situation that he faced, which, which is a huge part of the public looks at institutions through the, their prism of their own belief system. It's so, experience. so, and they, so he understands that we can't go have a system where six women in a court case where evidence was presented by both sides, make a decision that somebody's not guilty and then undermine that because he's having to deal with that at the federal government level. Whatever. So I think he's got to be very careful that like our justice system actually worked, actually worked there. The problem I think with the stand your ground laws, even though as everybody says, it wasn't used in the defense, it does create an environment. It does create an environment and is in the water table that allows people to feel like more free willing to use a gun in the course of well, something. And his yes. point about that, if, suppose Trayvon Martin was of age and had a gun and felt that he was threatened because he was being followed, uh, you know, and he could have used it that in the stand your ground law. Now that is, you know, that is well, worth I mean, a this conversation. Is, this is where it gets so, so complicated, Pierre, and I'm bringing it to you and then right. to Van Jones as well. The, the, the evidence is mixed on whether it reduces violence or not. One thing we know for sure is that justifiable homicides have gone up a lot since stand your ground laws have come in and that African Americans are, are must, much less likely to have their homicides found justifiable than white Americans. Well, again, through the prism of race, many African Americans believe that they won't get the benefit of, of the doubt if they use stand your ground on their behalf. And they believe in this case that Trayvon Martin would not have had an opportunity to stand his ground. And look, you can talk about this all you want. Race permeated that case, and many African Americans feel like that Trayvon Martin did not get justice. And you can say that the system worked properly and uh, everyone's talking that way, but you have a significant part of American society, that being the African, African American community, that feels like it failed. And this it gets to the number of the problem. Dana Prino, a whole lot of other Americans look at it and say it worked exactly the way it was supposed to work. Well, the other thing is that I think that they have to be careful about is so the FBI has already looked into it. They actually looked into George Zimmerman and they gave a full report to the state prosecution saying we can find no uh, instance of any sort of racial undertone of, of George Zimmerman. And maybe they'll find something else if they turn over more things. I mean, I don't know what else they could find. But also, I think that there, when, when a president speaks, it's to multiple audiences. So from the prism of self-defense, if you think of the young mother whose two-year-old son was shot in the face by the two black teens that approached her in Atlanta, and that baby is died, why, would, why do federal, why do presidents choose to, to speak about one case and not the other. That's why it's better maybe not to talk about any of them. They chose to talk about this one. I do think that the pres president was signaling we're going to have to move on. When it becomes, good luck on standing When it ground. becomes part of the national conversation, it's, it's almost impossible to right. ignore, though. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, the, the stand your ground situation is very, very problematic. You have Marissa Alexander. That's the next big case. She's the African American woman who tried to stand her ground and against fired, her husband, against her, her, husband. her abusive husband. She fired a bullet into the ceiling. She gets 20 years in jail for firing a shot into a ceiling, whereas uh, somebody who fires a shot into a teenager is still uh, walking the streets a free person. That is a reason for us to look at this. But there's something positive that has not been talked about from the right. Conservatives have weighed in. They said they are very concerned about the killings in Chicago and in other urban environments. Uh, African-American leaders have tended to dismiss that and say, well, they're just scoring political points against civil rights. They don't mean it. I think they may be too cynical. There may be a Jack Kemp 
a silent majority uh -huh. of conservatives that are heartbroken about the killings. There could be a right-left coalition to come together to try to talk about entrepreneurship, mentorship, public-private partnerships to stop these killings. That could be an outcome here. Let's not assume that when the president says well, we right, have a pathway forward, goes, we could actually come together over actually, this, not come apart. Actually, what, and which goes, Van, goes to this point of what, where, where Detroit is, which is our urban cores of this country. Detroit is actually the front and center of what's the problem we've had. And our urban cores, we've become much more homogeneous in our urban cores, where the suburbs are much different than our urban cores. The economy of the urban cores are much different. The money that is able to available for infrastructure. And in Detroit was in the course. vanguard of that. And Detroit was definitely in the vanguard of that. I mean, Detroit 50 years ago when our family lived there and, and my mother and father were raising kids there was much different as you went up and then as you drove up Woodward Avenue five miles until you went into Bloomfield Hills and all that. But we do have an urban problem and we do have a problem in this country where everybody is dividing by many different things. They're dividing by race. They're dividing by income. They're dividing by age. And that is going on throughout this country. The president understood this when he ran in 2008. I fault the president. I thought he spoke very well about it. He hasn't done much about it to bridge those divides. He gives a great speech. He hasn't done well. But I totally agree with you. If I were a Republican candidate mm -hmm. for president of the United States, somebody like Chris Christie or somebody, I would have an urban-centered strategy. Because if you can improve the urban areas, you're going to improve the economy. Yeah, the the mayor, you the do mayor that, Dana Perino, even if you're not going to get urban votes, you do it to signal yeah, to the rest of the country. You can. And it's good I for think the you country. do it because it's the right thing to do. If you think yeah. on education, that's the one piece you didn't mention. George W. Bush, when he runs on No Child Left Behind, that wasn't about schools in the suburbs and rural areas. Right. That was about urban schools and about the soft bigotry of low expectations of African American and Hispanic students. But I think it's also, you, you talk about we're divided along these lines, but we're less divided than we used to be. And and the president talking about his more daughters. Mm -hmm. Yes, and a more perfect union. We have, intermarriages are doubled, have doubled in the last 30 years, uh, interracial marriages. And, you know, and, and the new marriages, uh, it's 15%. So you start to to see people uh, mingling in ways that was just never the well, case. But before. I think we have a huge class. We have a huge class. We have a huge class distinction that's grown and grown and grown. And to me, the Trayvon Martin situation has more to do with class than it has to do with race, in my view. Because I think what happens in this country, anybody from a lower class, look about, think about the three women in Ohio that were basically kidnapped. And because they came actually from a different class, nobody really looked for them. Nobody really. And the health care that different classes get is totally different. So I think maybe we're less divided on race in this country, maybe, but our class distinction will become more profound. Yeah, you get the last word here. You know, the country is growing in terms of race relations, but going back to those urban corridors, major cities across the country. There's a group of people that have been largely forgotten, period. Great discussion. <laughs> Everyone stick around. We have a lot more to come.